great to have uh, uh, Lev Raisin here uh, from Georgia Tech. Uh, Lev got his uh, PhD at Yale working with Dana Engelin, and after that um, was uh, spent a year at uh, Yahoo New York working with John Langford, very known, and uh, now he's been uh, at Georgia Tech, at the post up there, and um, working on a, a variety of different kinds of problems in machine learning. Um, one thing I'll say is that he's going to be here today and tomorrow, and uh, his schedule is uh, booked up for this afternoon and most of tomorrow afternoon, but he has some openings tomorrow morning, uh, so if you're interested in meeting with him, just let me know and I can add you on. Thanks, Avram. All right. So I'll, I'll be talking about um, the contextual bandit problem and new algorithms for it that were developed um, a year or two ago while I was at Yahoo, um, and they really care about this problem, as you'll see shortly. And I'll be talking about three papers, um, focusing mostly on the first one, um, but I'll introduce them as they come up. And, and this work was done with a lot of different co-authors at a lot of different places, uh, mostly reconverged at Yahoo, though. So a problem that um, a search engine typically encounters is someone comes to the website, gives a query or an IP address, maybe some of their browser properties, et cetera, and the website serves the user some content, and the user either clicks on the content or doesn't. Maybe the user can do various other things. And it's not just this user, it's also this user and this other user, and they all come looking for different things. And in general, you can kind of think of the user in a machine learning setting, you can think of the user giving the, the search engine some context, and the search engine replies with some action. And then the user actually is the one that gives the search engine a reward by clicking or not, because when a user clicks on and the results, the, the search engine will often make money, for example, because if it's an ad, someone will pay them, and if it's a news story, something else will happen. But basically, the, the search engine is looking for clicks. So let me formally define the setting, well, first informally, then formally, and tell you some background on this. So it was first, um, so the, the setting I'll talk about was first looked at as something called the multi-armed bandits problem. And in this problem you have K slot machines and you can think of these slot machines as advertisements in, in, the, in, the, in the contact providing setting. And you have T time steps. And what a learner does is it's gonna try to maximize its reward. So for example, on time step one, it'll choose arm two. I'll say arm or machine or action, whatever. Um, these are all the same. And maybe it'll pay him 50 cents. He got 50 cents in his bank. And then maybe he'll choose <coughs> arm three. Arm three didn't pay off anything. So he'll go back to arm two. Now I give him 33 cents. And the money's accumulating. And after T rounds, you know, we go through this sequence. And perhaps this, this learner made 0.4 T. And um, so the learner is pretty happy, except for an evil entity comes and tells the learner how well he could have done had he just pulled one of the arms the entire time. So for example, had the learner pulled arm three the whole time, he would have gotten 0.33t. So the learner is glad he didn't do that. But had the learner pulled arm one the whole time, he would have gotten 0.5t, which is better than how the learner did. So this causes the learner to suffer regret of 0.1t. And the goal in these problems is to minimize regret, to do as well as you could have done had you known what would have happened the whole entire time. Now, um, so this was defined in 1952 by Robbins, and, and a lot of results were proven about this problem. But more recently, we've come to realize that um, a kind of a, a more expanded setting is necessary to capture the things that we want to do in the real world. So here comes the contextual bandits problem, or the bandits with experts problem. So you again have the, the slot machines. You can think of them again as advertisements. You have 
key rounds, but you also have experts or policies that give recommendations about what you should be doing. And you also have a context. So here how, here's how the game works. Context x1 comes in, and you can think of this as user features or browser settings, whatever it is. And these uh, experts or functions map from context to choice of arm. The learner then can look at the results of the recommendations he's received and ignore them or not and choose an arm. And then the game plays out exactly the same. Except for now the learner is not competing with fixed actions but with the policies. And you can think of the policies as, as you know, so there'll be n policies and you can think of n as being much larger than k because we want us to be able to compete with a much richer set of policies than just choosing one arm. Uh, namely, you could have a policy for each arm, just choosing it, plus more complicated things. And here you suffer regret uh, to, to the policies. So here you got point 0.2, but the best policy got point 0.22, t, two, point two two, so now your regret is point 0.02. <coughs> um, now, th there are a couple settings here. You, you could think of the, the reward <coughs> as coming from some distribution. You know, so each arm can have its m a, a different mean, for example. And it could pay off according to that. Or it could be adversarially set. As an, an adversary can come, look at your algorithm, look at your past history, and then set the rewards for the next round adversarially. Uh, and uh, you can either have these functions or not. And if you have them, <coughs> It's a contextual problem, and if you don't, it's a non-contextual problem. Clearly, the non-contextual stochastic problem is the easiest. The adversarial contextual problem is the most difficult. Oh, question? Yeah. So, the reward, you know, are the rewards that depend on the order? Are, are the rewards are independent? The rewards depend on the order you know, where you have the um, Oh, like on the time step, you mean? Right. Um, so, in the stochastic, they are not, because each round is an independent. Case, but in the adversarial, they can depend on, on the time step. So they can depend on the history, the algorithm. The only thing that they can't depend on is the randomness in the algorithm. Um, as, as, in, as in the adversary doesn't get to know your, the, the random bits you're going to have in the next round. Other, but, but in a stochastic um, setting, every time step is treated equally. So, so more formally, right? we have t rounds, k actions, n policies pi in a class big pie that go from context to actions and the game is the world commits to rewards in the next round the world gives you the context the learner's policies recommend stuff the learner chooses an action receives a reward and you want to compete with the best policy in hindsight some notation so the reward is just going to of an algorithm is just going to be the sum of the rewards it's gotten over all the time steps the expected reward of a policy is going to be the sum and so um, the sum over all the rounds of, of the, um, so this is, you, you could think about this as the reward vector, and this is a distribution over the actions. So, um, for example, uh, a policy could be non-deterministic. It could, say, choose these uniformly at random, or, or, or this could just, be deterministic choice of an arm, and the regret is the difference between how well you did and how well the best policy does. And so, so you can think of two notions. You can think of expected regret, where you're just competing with, um, you know, the, the 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 difference between how well you're doing an expectation and the best guy. Or you can think of a high probability bound on regret, as in you wanna <coughs> you wanna be Greater, you, know, you want to have regret greater than epsilon only with probability less than delta. So it's a standard learning uh, parameters. And, and, and the second type of bound is much more, more preferable to, to I mean, the th this bound is much better than the other, especially for a company like Yahoo. Because if you're doing well only in expectation, then you know, with some non-negligible probability, Yahoo just goes bankrupt or something, and that's not something we want. Okay, so, so a couple things we 
when I observe, um, one is that this is harder than, harder than supervised learning. In supervised learning, we, we know the, uh, if it's a multi-class prediction, you kind of know which class is the right one, which ones are the wrong ones, the payouts for all the classes. In the bandit setting, you don't know the rewards of the actions that you don't take. So, 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 so this is kind of harder. It has many applications, right? So not just ad auctions, medicine. So a person comes in and you look at their features, whatever they may be, and then maybe um, you're going to try to decide which medicine to give, the, to give each patient. And what you want to do is minimize regret, you know, how many patients you've killed. Um, and, and actually, this, this is an important point because what we do now is like double-blind studies, which you have a control group and a, and a, not, and, and, and a, a group in which you're testing your new medicine, and you're just going to run this thing no matter what's happening just to determine whether you're doing better in the new medicine, but, but you're killing patients in the process perhaps, and maybe you don't need to. And in finance, similarly, you, know, you have a lot of experts telling you whether the market is going to go up or down. And perhaps you want to do as well as the best expert, and, and generally you can because the experts don't really know what they're doing either. <laughs> um, and, and this is the, captures the famous exploration exploitation dilemma. You can, in any round, in some sense, exploit an action you know, th that you know to be good, as in show an <laughs> ad that you know everyone likes to click on, or you can explore, as in give a new thing that you don't really know much about and see how it's doing. But, but this is. This is good for the long term, but bad for the short term because in the long term, you know, you're possibly learning valuable information. In the short term, you could have your stuff not be clicked on. And, and this is uh, a, a good way to formalize this tension. So there are some barriers known for this problem. The first is even in the non-contextual case or in the contextual case, you have to suffer regret square root of KT. And these are lower bounds even in the stochastic setting. So if one ad is just always a little better than another, it'll take you some time to realize this, and by that time you'll have suffered some regret. And, and because of this lower bound, root kt or root kt log n, if it's the contextual setting, any algorithm that's root kt poly log n is said to be optimal because it kind of meets this bound. And... Um, one thing that you might try to do is first explore, as in first act randomly, and then follow the best policy you've learned. Um, this cannot be optimal, and I'll show you why later. Um, but basically, b in, while you're acting uniformly at random, trying to figure out what policy is best, you've already lost too much. What you need to do is be adaptive from the beginning. Once you start to see that a policy isn't doing well, right away you have to start backing off from it in order to try to get an optimal <coughs> algorithm. So there have been two types of approaches to this problem. Um, one is UCB, it's upper confidence bounds, and the other is um, exponential weights. Now the upper confidence bounds approach, what it does is for each ad, let's not think about experts right now, just think about the non-contextual problem. For each ad, it'll keep a confidence bound on its, uh, on its uh, payoff. <coughs> And what you do is you deterministically pull the arm with the highest upper confidence bound. And the argument kind of goes, well, either you're going to do well or you're not, in which case th the thing shrinks and then something else might become better. And notice that this can only work in the stochastic setting because, well, it won't make any sense to keep confidence bounds if the world is adversarial. Another type of approach, and you've probably seen this in a lot of places, it's exponential weights. What you do is you keep weights for each of the arms and then you choose an arm proportional, from a probability distribution that draws proportionally to these weights and then you update the weights exponentially in the rewards. So if something is doing badly, let's say you cut the weight in half if you listen to it. Um, and, and so these are the two approaches now. W what happens for the UCB approach is it's optimal for the stochastic setting and it actually succeeds with high probability because that's what confidence bounds are designed to do. But it doesn't work in the adversarial setting clearly and also it's not optimal for the contextual setting. Meaning that if you keep a confidence bound for each expert separately, you're going to 
basically be keeping too many confidence bounds and the algorithm won't really work. Exponential weight type of approaches, they're optimal for the adversarial and stochastic settings, which means that you can actually meet the lower bound, the stochastic lower bound, um, in the adversarial setting. So root kt is something you can achieve even in the adversarial setting using these algorithms. And they can be extended to work in a contextual setting, but they don't ex uh, succeed with high probability in the contextual setting. You can devise um, counterexamples, and, and this is because the weights reflect expectations, not anything else. And because of this, you, you can't expect to um, succeed with high probability. So this was the state of the world before the algorithm I'm going to present. So, so you, you could have an con optimal contextual algorithm, but it won't succeed with high probability. You can have a high probability contextual algorithm, but it won't be optimal. Or you could have a high probability optimal algorithm, but it's not contextual. And well, one thing that we do is, is we have an algorithm that's optimal, high probability, and contextual. And this is the first thing I'm going to describe. And the theorem looks like this, that you know, for any delta greater than 0 with probability at least 1 minus delta, you're going to have regret that looks like this. And it's optimal because you can't really expect to do better. And it combines advantages of all the previous approaches to get a high probability result. All right, so before I present the ideas that work, let me tell you about some obvious things you might try to make it uh, work, but don't work. Uh, but these ideas don't work. And this is the thing I started trying to do when I first approached this problem. So here's the first bad idea. You maintain a set of plausible hypotheses, let's say using confidence bounds, and you randomize uniformly over their predicted actions. And maybe this simple approach will work. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work. So if you just have two actions, one that pays off always one and the other always pays off zero. You can have the hypotheses generally agree on the correct action except for one that defects on every round. But you're randomizing between the two actions equal probably because you're just looking at over their predicted actions. And by the time you figure things out, you're going to have regret t over two. On the other hand, you could, for example, maintain a set of plausible hypotheses and randomize over the hypotheses, not the actions. <coughs> That's not going to work because, again, you can have one action that always pays off one, the other zero, and all but one of the hypotheses will always predict the wrong arm. And because you're, I mean, I'm sorry, so all but one, did I, did I say this wrong? So, so what I meant is only one pr predicts the correct arm, I'm sorry. And, and, and you can't really find which one it is until, it's, until you've suffered a lot of regret. Another strategy is the epsilon greedy approach, where you first act randomly and then try to take advantage of what you've learned. And you, we know that this won't get us optimal regret. And, and the way it works is that, well, while you're exploring, you're going to suffer at least well, you're going to suffer epsilon rounds of regret if epsilon is the amount of exploration <coughs> you do. And then you're going to, for the rest of the rounds, um, suffer this much regret. And that's because that's how good your estimate is. And if you set epsilon optimally, you're going to get t to the th two thirds regret. OK, so how does a, a good high probability algorithm work? Okay, it'll have a lot of components. Actually, all of these components have appeared in other algorithms, but haven't been put together uh, to work in the contextual setting. The first is you need to have exponential. Well, not you need to. I don't want. I mean, maybe there's something else that works, but but what we did is we needed to have exponential weights, as in we needed to keep weights for all the experts. We needed to use upper confidence bounds in addition to this. We needed to ensure exploration, as in we couldn't let the probability of any action be fall to be too small. And we needed to importance weight. And that is, if you take <coughs> an action with really low probability, you have to give this event a lot of credence. So if 
you only do this one in a million times and it pays off some, you have to kind of weight this payoff as a million. And, and this is just a debiasing trick. So, 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 so there was an algorithm, an exponential weight algorithm, um, by our um, Freund, Ches our Chester Bianchi, F Freund, Shapiri, that worked in expectation. So this was the old algorithm, and here's what you do: you you have some minimum, so you have some minimum probability of taking any action, and then you take actions otherwise proportionally to the weight of the experts that recommend that action. So that's what step one is. And P min can be set appropriately to make the thing work out. So then you have this probability distribution. You draw A from it. And then for each policy, you update its weight depending on whether you listened to it or you didn't. So if, if the policy um, if the policy chose the, the action that you took, you're going <coughs> to update its weight times e to the p min times this, this ratio, which is the reward you saw, <coughs> divided by the probability, the a priori probability of taking it. This is importance weighting. So this is your exponential fall off. And otherwise, you're not going to change the weight. And the way you modify, so if you try to put our algorithm in this framework, the way that you modify it is very simple. What you do is you basically add a confidence bound. So this part is the same. This is just, um, so, so, so this is the indicator of whether you took this action times uh, this reward that you got. We're going to call it y hat. That's just the, the debiased reward. And this is going to be like a variance term times, times this, which will make things work out kind of like standard deviations. And this will be v hat. So, so, so this part remains the same, but regardless of whether you took an action or not, you're going to shrink your <coughs> confidence bound. And the way you prove this is, well, first you can prove that, OK, so our estimate is for policy is just going to be the sum of the y hats. And you can define this standard deviation-like term as a function of these variances. And you could just prove that um, using a Friedman-style inequality, that all of your estimates are going to be within log n over delta times this um, sigma hat, um, at most that off from the true payoff with high probability. And then you can define um, u hat to be the best, the, 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 the best one of these guys as estimated, and you can show that, that uh, your algorithm is going to be, its performance is going to be bounded from <laughs> below in, as a function of this u hat plus some terms that are depend on kt and log n. And, and the way you can prove this is you keep tracks of the ratios of the weights of the experts. You look at um, how the total weight is decreasing as a function of how well you're doing. And, and you combining lemma one and two, you can, so you can substitute your estimate with the actual value, and you can get that you're doing well. Of course, I didn't go into any of the details, but a lot of this is, is just very, very um, annoying keeping track of weights. But the basic idea is that exponential weights and upper confidence bounds stack. So in a picture, if you want to see what this algorithm is doing, when you follow an expert, <coughs> you, uh, its weights will change, but then the confidence bounds will shrink. And you, what you want to do is update the weights exponentially still, but choose from a probability distribution that's not just of the weights, but a function of, of the confidence bounds as well. And both of these things get updated every round. And, and um, another thing you can use is um, you can generalize Bernstein's inequality for martingales. The, the, the original one requires you to have an upper bound on, on your variance, but you can prove things much more simply if you could have the, the inequality work for any estimate of the variance, not just an upper bound. And, and that's a small modification, but 
it's been used in future in, in papers after this one also and just makes <coughs> things a lot cleaner. Okay, so, so, so one issue that I need to discuss is efficiency. So I, I've added another column to this chart and that is whether you can make this algorithm efficient. What do I mean by efficient is, well, you have a lot of experts you're trying to listen to or compete with, and you can think of these experts as a policy class, like a large set of decision trees or any set of functions. And if you notice, our algorithm needs to keep weights and confidence bounds, one for each <coughs> policy in the class. So if you want to deal with an exponentially large policy class, well, in the regret, you're okay because it's logarithmic, but in the running time, you're not okay. And it turns out that <coughs> you can make, well, okay, so, so EXP3 or UCB is efficient because <coughs> it can't handle context. So, of course, it's efficient, but it's not contextual. That's not interesting. And the only interesting one that's efficient is epsilon greedy. You can actually make e epsilon greedy efficient in the contextual case, but it's not optimal. And, and, and somehow our algorithm, well, it's optimal, but you have to keep this huge list of things that you need to keep track of. And, and this is a problem. And I'm going to get back to how we can solve this problem. But first, um, I, I want to show how you know, this algorithm can actually apply to Yahoo. I promised myself that, that I would take whatever's on the front page recommended for me the day of my talk and display it so the data is right and I'm signed in and it decided that and <coughs> okay so, so what is what is this run on uh, that the Yahoo algorithm is uh, <laughs> runs um, trying to figure out which news story I will most like um, and today logging into Yahoo it's decided that I'll be interested in Angelina Jolie's something Oscar um, but what we did was we ran this on Yahoo data, and I don't know how interesting these details are. We created five clusters and put users in the, their proper cluster as a function of their features, and, and we mapped clusters to action choices, et cetera, and we were able to compete with a large policy class because we designed a policy class that, whose weights you can keep track of kind of implicitly. Um, so this is a very special case which you can actually do because we designed it that way. And um, <coughs> well, let me show you the, the chart. So EXP4P is our algorithm. This is the one that succeeds in expectation. And this one is um, epsilon greedy. Unfortunately, um, the way Yahoo has things set up is that instead of letting you run a full banded algorithm as, as, as you normally would, we, we, we had to have a learning bucket and a deployment bucket. The learning bucket ran on some of the data. So we, we, had, <coughs> we ran it on, 30, on 41 million user visits. We had over 200 algorithms, uh, 200 articles to display. And, uh, but we had to divide it into a learning phase and a deployment phase, which somehow separated exploration from exploitation already. And we could run our algorithm in the learning phase. And in deployment, we just chose the best learned policy. And it turned out that this new algorithm, EXP4P, actually beats in deployment all the others. And uh, one question is, why did this work? We don't really know. Because the theory told us it should work in one setting. And when we launched it in, in the setting at Yahoo, and it actually did better. Um, but it did. So higher numbers means, mean higher click-throughs. <coughs> OK, but let me get back to the theory of this. So another thing you can do is um, deal with VC sets. So let's say you have min infinitely many policies you want to compete with. Um, of <coughs> course, the bound of k t log n, where n is the number of policies, is vacuous. But if the policy class has finite VC dimension, d, then you can tackle this problem. But we need an IID assumption. And let's just assume that there are two actions to make the argument simpler. So just a quick note on the VC dimension. Uh, it captures a class, class's expressive power. And it's a cardinality of the largest set that the class can shatter. And shattering means to label in all possible ways. So what you do is um, 
if you want to compete with a with an infinite class of policies, you can act uniformly at random for a while, and then you can partition the policies into equivalence classes according to the way they've labeled the rounds that you've acted ra randomly on. Then you pick a representative from each equivalence class and you run our algorithm on the representatives. And there's a nice thing called Tower's Lemma which bounds the number of equivalence classes when the VC dimension is limited. So you, you can say that the algorithms regret to pi prime, which is the representatives of the equivalence classes, is t, which is how long you've um, been um, acting randomly for, plus this function of d and tau. And then you need to bound pi prime, which is the representatives regret to the original thing, and you can also do this by just looking at the probability that you'll disagree on future. If you're put in one equivalence class, you know, what's the probability you'll disagree later? And you can work this out, out and you'll get um, an optimal trade-off for tau, and then you can get dt to the one-half regret. So, so, so this is nice, but it's still inefficient, as in you still need to do this large enumeration. So one thing we know, for example, if if you're trying to compete with linear predictors, then you can also get a D, root DT algorithm, but this one will be efficient because there are algorithms designed specifically for various um, settings. So this one is called lin UCB. But in general, um, in, in general, we kind of have this, this uh, kind of reduction, but, but it doesn't give you everything you want because it's still inefficient. So let me talk about what it would mean to have an efficient algorithm. So let, re let me remind you, our algorithm's dependence on n, the number of policies, in the regret is logarithmic. And this suggests we should be able to compete with really huge policy classes without suffering a lot. And you want to compete, right? You want to throw the kitchen sink into your algorithm, everything you can think of, and say, well, I've thrown all these policies in and I'll still be able to compete with the best one and I'm not going to suffer much in the regret. So for example, if you make n the number of policies equal to k to the 100, eh, just 10 log root log k in the regret. That's not much. However, you can't keep track of k to the 100 policies. Even just reading it in their recommendations would take too long. So what do you do? So one thing, one insight we have from regular machine learning or supervised learning is that we all, all often compete with large, even exponentially large sets of policies, right? So what does it mean to compete with? Well, you want to find the best one. So we can do linear threshold functions. We can do CNF. People do decision trees in practice, not in theory, all the time. And we have all sorts of methods like boosting, SVM, neural networks, gradient descent. So, so when we try to find the best linear threshold, we don't enumerate all the infinitely many linear thresholds. What we do is we realize there's an implicit representation. And this, this idea, um, the idea is to, well, if we're allowed to do this in supervised learning, then why can't we do this in the bandits literature? And, and um, John Langford and Tang Zhang thought of this idea earlier, and their idea was, well, why don't we allow the algorithm to have an oracle that can do supervised learning? What does it mean? You can give it the policy class that you have for bandits. You can give it fake data with rewards and context and everything. And then it'll have to give you a good policy. Let's say the best policy in here. And th they thought of this idea, but they didn't get it working. They just they said that you should be able to do this. So they got it working, but had a non-optimal algorithm, kind of a version of epsilon greedy. So one thing we did was have an algorithm for this. Just, just one warning, though. This, this is NP-hard in general. So assuming this oracle means that, in the worst case, you can solve NP-hard problems. This is kind of like agnostic learning. And we know that, that it might be hard sometimes. But nonetheless, we tackle this problem all the time. So what is, how, how, how does this work? So so again, let's say we're on round three. We have a history, some context. 
some recommendations from experts, but in addition we have this oracle into which we can feed our policy class, we can make up data however we wish for, all the pre for as many rounds as you wish and then the oracle will give us an expert and we can do whatever we want with the expert, we can call this oracle many times and the theorem is that we can actually get an optimal algorithm, so root kt log n and we can do this in time polynomial in kt and log n assuming that we have an oracle that can optimize over our policy class I'm not going to give you the full details but I want you to be able to approach this paper if, if you uh, feel like it so how does this work? Okay, so first we can observe that if arms are chosen only among only the good policies such that all of our choices have low variance we can win so we're only going to choose among, yeah? Arms are like ads and policies are things that map contexts to choices of ads. So like the policies are like the Einsteins and, and the arms are like the slot machines. Oh, and, and, and this will only work in a stochastic setting, I should say. Okay, so first we can say that if all the arms are chosen only among the good policies, let's say as kept track of by confidence bounds, and all of our choices have low variance as in all our estimates will be good, then we're going to win. And you can prove that, that such a distribution exists via minimax theorem. Then you can relax this condition and allow occasionally choosing bad policies. And we call this randomized upper confidence bounds. And now this creates a problem of how do you choose arms as to satisfy these constraints. And you can express this at a, as a convex optimization problem. But for convex optimization, we have something called the ellipsoid algorithm which requires um, a separation oracle as in something that if you are not at a good solution you need a hyperplane that separates you from, all the, from the feasible region and it turns out that you can implement a separation oracle via one of these supervised learning oracles and then unwind this whole thing and get an algorithm that works but the interesting thing is we're using the supervised learning oracle in a completely perverse way right it's, 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 it's a separation oracle for a convex program that solves something else. So, um, yeah, so this isn't practical to implement. We can't run it on Yahoo data, but in theory, we got an algorithm that's efficient and optimal and everything you could want. Um, it'd be interesting to actually theoretically do this for the adversarial setting. It seems very hard, but there's nothing that says it can't be done. It would be a very nice breakthrough. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I, actually I think I'm doing well on time, so I was afraid I wouldn't get to it, but I, I will, um, is slates. Um, so in reality, the other problem that search engines have is that they don't just show one ad. I mean, okay, so for news articles, they feature just one news article, but in general, they don't have a problem of just showing one ad, they need to show a slate of ads. I, I just want to note that I'm, I mean, there are a lot of models for tackling this and they all started coming around two years ago and um, people are working on this problem for various directions. But I'll, I'll focus on just this formulation. So what we need is to select not one arm but S arms. And this is just a strict generalization. And the motivation is again, uh, a search engine shows multiple ads to a user, not just one. So, um, on round T, the algorithm selects a slate S sub T of S arms. And um, you can think of this as being unordered or ordered, as in does order <coughs> matter in the slate or not? Um, we tackled both problems. And you can think, well, will there be a context or not? As in you could still have experts on top of these things recommending slates. And we tackled both. But I'm going to focus on the unordered, non-contextual version just to give you the idea of how a, what a solution looks like. And what happens is the algorithm sees the rewards for all the actions in the slates it's chosen, right? It knows which ads the users have clicked on and it receives reward that's the sum of all the rewards of the arms it's chosen. One obvious solution is just reduce this to the regular banded problem, right? You create a, a fake arm for each slate. But we can do much better than the reduction.
All right, so I drew a picture, which might not make any sense, I, 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 but let's see if it makes some sense uh, to you. Uh, it makes some sense to me. So the upper uh, left corner is just, so we're going to have three possible articles. And the upper left corner uh, corresponds to deterministically just showing the first article. This corner is deterministically showing the second article, and this is the third article. But our slate requires us to show two articles. So that's going to be the blue triangle. So the top of the blue triangle is, 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 it means that we're going to show uh, the first two, the first and the third, and the last two. Okay. And here's how the algorithm works. In the beginning, it, this x mean, is in the center, which means it's, it's going to show every article equiprobably. And we can decompose this as a convex combination this of, of not of these points, which we could always do, but of the blue corners. And that means we're going to show each, because we're showing each article equal probably, we can decompose this into a convex combination of, of these slate guys. And it, just because we started in the center, it means that we're going to show each slate equal probably. And OK, so let's say we chose this slate because we rolled our dice and OK, did this. Now um, we got some rewards. And we're going to do a multiplicative update on the probability distribution, kind of like we did before. I wrote this in terms of losses, but you can think of rewards as like negative losses or something. And, and this took us out of, out, of, out of the blue region, which means this vector cannot be com expressed as a convex combination of slates. So for example, this guy is clearly can't be expressed as a convex combination of slates because it's just saying choose the last one. OK, so, so what you need to do is project back onto the blue region. And you do this via a relative entropy projection. So you want to find a point that minimizes the relative entropy between, between this guy and, and the target. Um, and this is also called component hedge um, in an independent work by um, Walter Kulin et al. that appeared in Colt. OK, and then you continue. So now you have this point. Now you're going to decompose uh, it again. You're going to do your update and keep going. So, so there are a lot of parts to this, right? So the first is um, you need to do a multiplicative update. That's easy. How do you do a relative entropy uh, projection? So we show how to do this efficiently. You also need to show that you could always decompose this efficiently, which we show you could do. And this idea extends both to when order matters, though I haven't given you the model, and it extends to, to dealing with experts as well. And then you can prove um, that various nice things happen because relative entropy is, is a Bregman projection and, or Bregman divergence, and, um, and things work out. So th these are the results that we get. So with no policies, we're going to get um, an extra factor of s. So it's not going to be root kt. It's going to be s root skt. Um, and with policy, it'll, it'll be root skt log n. And if, if you have positional factors, as in if order matters, then the s uh, falls outside of the square root, not inside the square root. Uh, one, one thing you might think is, um, did we really do better than, than the reduction, right? Because remember, if we created an expert for each slate, then we could have had kt log n, and then we would have had k to the s experts. And if you take the log of that, then it would be skt again. But remember, the range is not 0 to 1. It's 0 to s. Uh, so, so there would have been an extra factor of s that we're saving compared to a reduction. If you didn't follow that, don't worry. Um, and actually, uh, because these problems are in the air, um, Uchi et al. Um, also in 2010 tackled the upper left corner um, via a completely different algorithm, but got the same result. Uh, by the way, we don't have lower bounds um, that have S's in them, so that's a fun problem to work out. Um, so, so there are still gaps between what we know we can do and what our lower bounds say. Um, so just to briefly summarize, 
This contextual bandit setting captures many different problems. Um, one thing we gave is an optimal high probability contextual algorithm. We showed how you can make it efficient, but we're not fully there yet because the algorithm right now is crazy. What you would really want is you know, to, to maybe have some policies, add some noise, get the best one, and be done. But that's not how our algorithm works. Um, that, that's how an algorithm by um, Adam Kalai and Santos Rampala works for the, um, for the online setting, where you can actually see everything that happens, even where you, in actions that you didn't choose. And then we talked about slates, which is um, more practical. Um, It'd be fun, for example, to make them efficient, right? So we have experts in slates. We have a way to make experts efficient, so combining those. So, so there's still a lot of stuff to be done, but, but it, I mean, we've seen that theory helps make things more practical, and, and this is an interesting problem. Um, so hopefully some more people will take it up. Thanks. So, so in some sense, that's outside of the modeling assumption. What you would kind of want, if you have a slate of two things, you'd want to display one jaguar, like one animal and one car, to capture more. And what we kind of say is, um, so, so this is, um, th this what you would need is interaction between elements in the slate. Um, and a lot of people have considered this, and, and it turns into a set covering problem. You want to cover a lot of set with some elements, and um, there are different models for this. The only interaction we have is that, you can't display the same ad in both positions in the slate. So, so what you're, the, the observation you have is a very valid one, but it's outside of this model. So there is no, we're, not, we're not assuming that if you, if you have, like, the, the first one interferes with the second one. Right, so, so what you do is, um, so originally, for just in the original algorithm, XP4P, what you do is you have a probability distribution over all the experts, and you choose an expert from that probability distribution, and then, and then you look at the action it took, and then you update the actions of all the experts that predicted that action, even if you didn't choose to follow them, because you followed the same action anyway. And, 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 and this, this, um, this is, so, so you don't combine it, you in some sense just, draw from a probability distribution from it, but. Oh, so this is a setting where you have several experts each in the What about if you yeah. have many features, mm -hmm. not several experts, you only have features? Yeah. And you want to do anything based on those features? Well, I mean, you can think of, I mean, if you're deciding based on features, then you can think of the decision rules as experts. Um, so I don't know what it means to decide based on features if you don't have a mapping from features to policy, to, to actions. Let's say I have a value function, yeah. which is a mapping from features to value. Yeah. And I will always choose the action with the highest value or the action which have highest bound or value. And you only have one function. One function. And you have one set of features. And you always choose the, the action. action which have highest value or the highest bound. OK. How about that? Wait, so what's the problem? Uh, uh, the, the algorithm. Well, I mean, that, that, that's. Do people do that? Why do that? Why? Oh, I see. I see. Well, I mean, I, I would imagine that you have a lot of functions and you're trying to find the best function, right? But in reality, it's usually easier to create features than create functions. So I think we'll have to take this offline because. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so good question. 
I don't know. I, so there, there seems like there, there could be some relationship. That's true. But I mean, stochastic dynamic, d d dynamic programming is, is, is a technique, right? So first you have to phrase this problem properly, and then you have to show that this gives you something. But that might be good. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not have to enumerate all the way. So, uh, but then he said, well, it's kind of like a consultant agnostic learning problem. So, yeah. Because um, you know, in, in a lot of learning contexts, when you're in that kind of situation, you say, well, let me, you know, back off of my like hinge loss where I can, mm. you know, I don't know how to minimize zero one loss, but I can minimize hinge loss. That's a great that question. Back uh, off of hinge flow. <laughs> Is there an analog? That, that's a great question, and, and that's, it, it'd be nice if we had some, had somehow had this, right? If we had this oracle that minimizes hinge laws, then we could do something and prove something about our regret. And that's something we thought about for sure, but it, it, you know, precisely for the reason that hinge loss is, is kind of a proxy loss, which doesn't really give you anything if you're talking about regret, which is kind of like zero, one loss. So you need some proxy regret. So you need like proxy regret. and then. I don't know if people will find it interesting. But that would be great because then you could actually implement the Oracle, run the thing. Um, yeah. And, and, and in, in practice, one way to implement this Oracle is just to pretend you have hinge loss, minimize that. Whatever happens, happens. And you know, maybe you're not solving the, the, the convex program, but, but it'll give you something. So just use that and see what happens. Sure. There, there is. So, so um, I mean, there's a lot of work about sleeping bandits. The idea is not, not all actions are available. Okay. Um, you could, for example, um, if you know how many ads you will, you will um, have in the future, you can kind of do things where, where in any round you only have a live set of ads and you only choose among those. And you can make things like this work out. In fact, in our experiments, we had over 200 ads, but only 20 were available at any given time. And, and there's a way to do it practically, and there's a way to keep all the regret balance the same, but it's not, I mean, yeah, so the answer is yes. Okay. So, so another question is uh, also related to your empirical evaluation. So, so you, you're somehow empirical evaluation with Python because you, you learn first and then you apply the fixed policy. Well, we didn't learn first. We <laughs> learned kind of, so each time a context a user came in, we put them in the deployment bucket or learning bucket randomly. And, and what we did was there were parameters you have to tune, and we tuned them to minimize the, to m optimize the clicks in the deployment. And, yeah. So do you have any idea what you do in controls? Since, like, you obviously, what you, uh, what you show in the past will have an effect what you show in the future. Because, like, based on what you show in the case, you learn different parameters. So how do you? You know, I'll, I'll actually, I think Yisang knows more about this than I do. <laughs> you guys can, no, um, in reality, I, I don't, so, so it's a great question, right? Like, in some sense, there's, a, there's another way in which you can be greedy, you know, greedy as in we keep showing the same thing that people click on, and then you die off as a search engine because you're not giving people variety. And this is the type of thing you want to model, right? And I don't know how to do that. At least not in a way that gives interesting theory. 